Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. I am your professor, Philippe Girard. Last time we began exploring the history of Sub-Saharan Africa. I mentioned that, generally speaking, population density was low, and so large centralized empires were few, except in areas that were more conducive to human settlement, like Mali, which will be today's topic. Speaking of the history of Sub-Saharan Africa, that's a bit of a misnomer, though. As you remember from section 1, history officially begins when writing appears, and most of Sub-Saharan Africa did not have a writing system in the period we're studying prior to the year 1500. So technically we should be speaking of prehistoric times, before the invention of writing. Prehistory does not mean that nothing happens, however. There are still people, inventions, wars, epidemics, etc. It's just more difficult for scholars like myself to retrace the chain of events. So it's time for you to pause the video for a second and ask yourself, if you were a scholar trying to retrace the early history of, I don't know, Mali, prior to the invention of writing, what sources would you use? Go ahead, hit the pause button and put your sinking caps on. Well, the main source of information for paleontologists and archaeologists is the physical record. Just pick a shovel, start digging, and you go back in time. The deeper the layer of soil, the older the record. Uh, along the way, you might encounter skeletons, and those will help you determine how many people lived in a given area, what they ate, how old they lived, whether they sustained injuries in battle, whether they were eaten by others, the ratio of males to females, etc. Archaeological digs will also uncover remnants of houses, artifacts like tools or statues of gods, and all those are useful too. You can also learn a lot about a society by digging through their ash piles or their trash pits. Another option when dealing with an illiterate society is to gather up accounts by neighboring countries who were literate. In the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, they were visitors from the Mediterranean world as early as antiquity. And then again on a large scale when Europeans began the age of exploration in the 1400s. Another very literate society, the, the Muslims, they also visited Sub-Saharan Africa. In a previous lecture, for example, we studied the traveler Ibn Battuta, who traveled to Mali, among other places, and left us a detailed account of his travels. Those accounts are great because they give us a more fine-grained account of a society than can be gleaned by simply looking at a skeleton or trash pile. But those foreign accounts by no mean, are by no means perfect. By definition, outside observers, they don't always understand the foreign society they just encountered. Uh, the language is alien. So are the traditions. It took me a long time to fully understand U.S. society when I moved to this country, even though I spoke English and I came from a country, France, that shares the same basic cultural values as the U.S. So a person like M. Batuta, who spoke Arabic and only briefly visited Mali from Morocco, he probably missed the most subtle aspects of Malian society. When we analyzed primary sources in our class discussion, a key factor was personal bias, remember? When Martin Luther wrote about the Protestant Reformation, for example, his take on it was quite different from what the Council of Trent had to say in the other document, right? Well, that's also true for those foreign accounts, especially when it comes to religion. M. Batuta was a devout Muslim. Uh, Portuguese explorers who came to Africa, they were devout Catholics. So always be skeptical when those people made disparaging comments about African animist practices. Uh, Muslim accounts of the history of Mali, for example, they generally start with the first kings who converted to Islam in Mali, even though the history of Mali goes much further back in time. But for Muslim writers like Ibn Battuta, the pre-Muslim era, that was not worth writing about. So to balance these foreign accounts, it's essential to gather up some local sources as well. And when written accounts are non-existent, because there's no uh, writing until a recent period, historians must rely instead on oral traditions, whatever has been preserved orally from word of mouth. And historians are generally uncomfortable with those oral sources for various reasons. Uh, for one, oral traditions only go back that far in time. So you probably heard stories from your grandma about her grandma. But I doubt that you know much about your family five or six generations into the past unless you had some written documents that you could peruse. Oral traditions can also change over time. When a letter is written on a piece of paper, the words will remain the same for the next 1,000 years. But if a story is transmitted to a grandchild who tells that story to her grandchild, and so on, uh, 
uh, there's a strong chance that details will be changed along the way. It's like playing telephone as a kid. But, and the but, we should not dismiss oral traditions altogether. They are usually a good way to balance our written record, which is heavily tilted toward the elites. In the 1930s, for example, as part of the New Deal, there was a program to interview old black men and women in the South about their youth. At that time, in the 1930s, there were still people alive in the U.S. who had been born before the Civil War in the 1860s and who had experienced slavery firsthand as a child. So this way, uh, we now have first-hand accounts by former slaves or history is collected in the series whereas most of the written record that we have otherwise about slavery was written by slave owners and such in the 19th century, and it's programmatic and biased. All traditions can also be more reliable than you would think. Take the Iliad, for example. The Iliad began as oral traditions, which were eventually put in writing by the poet Homer. And much of the Iliad is obviously myths. Gods pop up regularly in the narrative, for example. So for a long time, historians just dismiss the Iliad together as a piece of literature rather than a true historical source. Until the 19th century, when one archaeologist had the crazy idea of going looking for the city of Troy using the Iliad as a guide. And using clues in this epic poem, uh, that archaeologist located a potential site in Turkey, started, dig started digging, and lo and behold, he found multiple layers of ruins from an ancient city, including some layers indicated that the city had been destroyed in a war, the Trojan War. So be very careful when using oral sources, but don't dismiss them outright because they're often based on a kernel of truth. Oral histories were particularly prominent in West Africa before writing became widespread because that was the only way to record history. There was a specific group of people called the griots. Think of them as historians, bards, entertainers, bunch into one. The griots were hired by powerful local families to memorize a history and pass that history on to future generations. And that way, at the wedding, you could ask a griot to retell the history of your family's ancestors going back centuries into the past, even. So it's not a perfect source since the goal was to celebrate the deeds of powerful families, but it's an interesting source nonetheless since the written record uh, by Africans is so spotty. And that brings us to an important historical concept called historiography. And let me explain what I mean by that. It's a bit complicated. Most people assume that history is fairly cut and dry, right? You just open a textbook, you read the chapter on the Persian Empire, and that's it. You get the facts, just take notes. Historians like myself, we are assumed to be the voice of God. We tell you how the past unfolded, and students are expected to take notes. The reality is far messier when you start looking into how the sausage is made. Historians can only describe what they found in the sources, and those sources, especially for pre-colonial sub-Saharan Africa, are often few and problematic, so we cannot retell the past with 100% certainty. This also means that our understanding of the past can always change as new sources are discovered. Think of Thomas Jefferson. For many years, historians read his letter, the Declaration of Independence, all the written sources, and they wrote biographies as geographies, celebrating him as a hero of the Age of Enlightenment, who fought for liberty and freedom. But there was a family oral tradition among some mixed-race families of Virginia, and that tradition claimed that Jefferson had sex with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings, and that he had fathered children by her. Many historians dismissed that story as mere gossip. After all, that was just based on an oral tradition, right? Until new techniques like DNA appeared, and by comparing blood samples from the official Jefferson family and those of descendants of Sally Hemings, historians discovered that the rumors were true. Jefferson did have sex with Sally Hemings, and that forced historians to revisit their views of Jefferson based on the new evidence. He was not just a herald of freedom, but also an exploiter of slaves or even a rapist. Of course, a lot of the information about Jefferson owning slaves had been available for centuries. Uh, U.S. historians have simply preferred to ignore it because it was painful to acknowledge that a founder, father, founding father of the U.S. Republic had been tied to an evil institution like slavery. So it was not until the 1960s that a new generation of historians really began to ask a tough question about Jefferson, like, why did he exploit slaves? Was he a hypocrite who yelped about liberty while owning human beings? And notice that the 1960s, that's also a time when young radicals entered academia. 
And also one historical profession became more diverse because more African Americans became academics. So the changing views of Jefferson didn't just come from new evidence like DNA tests, they also came from different historians taking a different look at old existing evidence. So that's what historiography is about. Our, our understanding of the past changes over time, either because we encounter new evidence or because new historians interpret existing evidence in a new way. I repeat the definition. Historiography is how our understanding of the past changes over time, either because we uncover new evidence or because new historians interpret existing evidence in a new way. It's a difficult concept to grasp, but it's an important one. Soon we're going to study Christopher Columbus, another famous figure whose reputation has changed a lot in the historiography from great hero and explorer to fraud, murderer, or even perpetrator of genocide. All that based on the same kind of evidence to start with. But back to Africa. Uh, my main goal for that slide was to explain that the sources are not always perfect, that we historians are not always impartial either, and so take everything we say with a grain of salt. We historians strive to find the truth, but we can't be absolutely certain that we do. Let's now zoom in on Mali. Uh, there is a present-day country called Mali, whose borders were set by French colonizers just a century ago. And that modern Mali roughly corresponds to a medieval kingdom, also called Mali, which actually spanned even more ground to the Atlantic. Notice the location on the map. Uh, pause for a second and try to match the location there to what I said last time about climate zones of Africa. So what climate zone are we talking about when it comes to Mali? Well, that would be the intermediate zone between the equatorial rainforest near the equator and the dry Sahara Desert to the north, right? So the landscape would be the Sahara and then further north, the Sahel Steppe region. And that region can be quite dry, but notice that there's a major river there, the Niger River, which made it possible to sustain a denser population uh, than would otherwise be possible by using irrigation along the banks. Also, there were gold mines in the region, so that was obviously a plus when building an empire. For that reason, several empires grew and fell in the area of the Niger River, including Ghana from roughly the 8th to the 13th centuries, and then later, much later on the Songhai Empire from roughly the 15th to the 16th centuries, and Mali, which reached its apex in between those two, uh, Ghana and Songhai. I want to focus on just two of the rulers of Mali, uh, the founder of the dynasty, Sudhyata Keita, and then the richest and the most powerful of Mali's kings, Mensa Musa. First, Sundiata Keita, who reigned from 1230 to 1255. We know him mostly through the epic of Sundiata, a set of oral traditions that were transmitted by griots. And remember what I told you earlier about oral traditions. They're usually best based on some kernel of truth, so dis don't discount them altogether. Uh, but they are far from a perfect source, so don't get too hung up on every little detail either. The story of the epic of Sundiata begins with a Mandinka king named Konate, who one day received a visit of a divine hunter at his court. As you recall from the previous lecture, hunters visited the bush, so they had magical powers. That hunter predicted that if King Konate married an ugly woman, she would give him a son who would one day be a mighty king. King Konate was already married and already had a son, which by itself was not an obstacle, since polygamy was common among African royalty. But the part about the woman being ugly was less appealing. But such was a prophecy. It had to be an ugly woman. So soon after, two people, again hunters, showed up in court and presented King Konate with a really ugly hunchback woman named Sogolan, which means the buffalo woman. Not the most flattering nickname. She sure was ugly but the king remembered the prophecy and he married her anyway. And soon she gave birth to a son, our hero, Sundiata Keita. His childhood was not an easy one because he was unable to walk throughout his childhood due to polio over this young. Then when his father, King Konate, died, the first wife and her son, they claimed the throne and the young Sundiata Keita and his buffalo mother had to go into exile. But that kind of difficulty is how heroes are made. They have to overcome obstacles to achieve greatness. 
When you watch the Olympics on NBC, they never tell you that an athlete has a natural gift and that athlete easily gain, claim the gold medal. Instead, there's always some heartwarming story about the athlete overcoming a major injury or the death of their puppy or what have you, and still winning the gold medal in the end. Same thing with Teddy Roosevelt. Historians will never present him to you as an entitled brat from some rich Manhattan family, even though that's what he was. Instead, historians will tell you how he struggled with asthma and myopia as a child, but he embraced a strenuous life and he overcame these hurdles and became Teddy Roosevelt. Same thing with Sundiata Keita. He got a blacksmith to give him a steel rod to make a cane and braces for his legs. And blacksmiths are also magical figures in African folklore, kind of like alchemists in Europe. And that way, Sundiata Keita was able to pull himself upright and walk for the first time. And then our little forest gun forged a coalition of neighboring small kingdoms, defeated his rival and half-brother at the Battle of Kirina, and named himself Mensa, which means the King of Kings. And that's how he became the first ruler of the Mali Empire. That story kind of reminds me of the rise of Genghis Khan in many ways. Again, I'm not exactly sure about the magical aspects of the story, the buffalo woman, the omen, the hunters, etc. Uh, but the Battle of Karina, that's mentioned in other sources, and obviously the Mali Empire too. So there's some truth to the epic overall. Sundiata Kena now is a major hero in Mali, just like George Washington would be here. So a ton of avenues, schools, airports are named after him. Make sure to mention Sundiata Kena when you meet a friend from Mali. That person will be very happy. Then under the successors of Sundiata Keita, the empire of Mali eventually reached all the way from the Niger River in the east to the Atlantic in the west, as well as the Sahara in the north. That empire grew rich through trade and agriculture due to the presence of the Niger River, and a leading export was the nut of the kola tree, K-O-L-A, that's a tree native to West Africa. Kola nuts, they're rich in caffeine and they're often chewed as a stimulant to combat fatigue, hunger, just like coffee today. And that's also used in traditional African folk medicine to cure ulcers and diarrhea and dysentery and the like. And there was also a key ingredient in the original recipe for Coca-Cola, a beverage that is named after the cola nut. The other ingredient of Coca-Cola was coca, as, a, as in cocaine, uh, which come from a leaf, the coca leaf from South America. We'll mention it when we study the Incas in the next section. The Saharan provinces of the Mali Empire were also home to gold and salt mines. Uh, gold was valuable, of course, but also salt, which was a major way to preserve food in a world without canning or refrigeration. Another main item of exports from Mali was slaves. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. As a result, the Empire of Mali was at the nexus of major trading routes that connected West Africa to North Africa and huge caravans of up to 25,000 camels would cross the Sahara from Timbuktu in Mali uh, to North Africa. And the king of Mali, uh, he collected a tax on each transaction, which made him fabulously rich. The most famous of these kings, after Sundiata Keita, of course, was Mensa Musa, who I believe was his grandnephew. He was mostly known for his fabulous wealth. Having gold mines in your backyard always helps with your finances, obviously. But he was also a convert to Islam who traveled to Mecca and as a result became well known in Arab circles and even European circles. By the time of Mensa Musa, Mali fam uh, was famous enough that the country appeared on world maps, whether, were, whether they were drawn in Baghdad uh, or in Paris, France. So we have far more sources about Mensa Musa, especially those written by outsiders. In section two of the course, we studied the five p uh, pillars of Islam and one of those was the Hajj. Each Muslim is required to travel to Mecca once in his lifetime if he can afford it. Mensa Musa obviously could afford it, so he made a famous trip to Mecca in 1324 to 25, and he traveled in style. He was followed by a retinue of thousands, including 500 slaves bearing golden staffs and 100 camels loaded with 300 pounds of gold each. And during his stay in Cairo, he spent so much money that the local price of gold plummeted and only recovered 10 years later. That's how rich he was. Mensa Musa came back from his pilgrimage to Mecca with a renewed sense of faith. And for example, the Quran indicates that freeing a slave, that's a good deed. So he freed one of his slaves every day of his life 
going forward. So maybe you can say, wow, Mansa Musa really was a good Muslim, or wait a minute, how many slaves did he own in the first place? I'll go with the latter. Mansa Musa also brought back Muslim scholars from Mecca, and he attempted a systematic conversion of his people to Islam. So he built splendid mosques, including my personal favorite, which is this mosque, the Mosque of Jenny, which looks like something out of a Star Wars movie set. The capital of Timbuktu became a major center, not just for, for trade, but also for scholarship as well, because it was home to Sankore University. When I studied similar institutions in the U.S. France or Morocco, I mentioned that the term universities did not exactly mean the same thing back then as it does now. University in the Middle Ages did not have a set curriculum, an administration, or a rec center. Uh, and it was also heavily focused on religious learning, whether it's the Bible or the Quran, rather than the arts and sciences. Well, Sankore University in Timbuktu was like that too. Uh, students would attach themselves to a favorite scholar or imam and learn directly from him in the courtyard of his private residence. But some serious scholarship was made and a lot of writing done. A few years back, I learned that there was a major push by the British Library in London to digitize all these ancient manuscripts, which are still stored in the attics of private residences in Timbuktu to this day. And that would be a fantastic resource for every scholar out there to be able to look at all these ancient manuscripts from the golden age of Timbuktu. The reign of Mensa Musa really marked the apex of the Empire of Mali. Uh, later on, there were factional disputes between various pretenders to the throne, and that led to civil wars and the disruption of trade. And local vassals then no longer saw the point of obeying a king who could not maintain eternal peace, and then they revolted, and the empire kind of fell apart. But Islam survived, and remains a major religion in West Africa to this day. Which is a great segue to our last topic for today, which is slavery. Last time we saw how slavery was practiced in many local African societies, often as part of internal kinship networks, Africans enslaving distant African rulers. The slavery, the slavery I want to cover today is quite different. Uh, it's a slavery as governed by Muslim law, Sharia. And indeed, the Muslim holy text, the Quran, mentions slavery and does not condemn it. It's entirely possible for a good Muslim to own slaves under Sharia law as long as he or she follows certain rules. First rule, you can't just enslave everyone. Specifically, it's forbidden to enslave a fellow Muslim. As a result of jihad, that was a common path to enslavement in the Middle Ages. Uh, when Muslim armies invaded a province, they first offered the local infidels to submit and convert to Islam. If they did, they would be incorporated into the Muslim world with minimal bloodshed as free people. If they refused, however, the Muslim invaders would declare a jihad, a holy war, after which, if they were victorious, uh, they would be allowed under Quranic law to enslave uh, all the infidels that they had defeated. By the way, several students have asked me uh, in previous classes, what happens if you convert to Islam after the conquest, after a jihad, uh, after you've been enslaved? And the answer is, sorry, it's too late. The second set of rules pertaining to slavery in the Quran governs how slaves should be treated. And according to the Quran, slaves should be treated well as if they were lesser members of the family. They should be fed and clothed appropriately, and there was a path to emancipation in some circumstances. We even saw how freeing a slave like Mansa Musa did every day, that could earn you some brownie points in heaven. Of course, declaring that slavery uh, in the Muslim world was relatively benign just by looking at the law, that's a dangerous game. I know from experience, when I studied slavery in the Caribbean, uh, that the reality of slavery was often far worse than what the law dictated. Uh, for example, under Quranic law, a master could take on a slave as his concubine, roughly his wife, uh, but he could not exploit her sexually by prostituting her to various clients. And that clause was supposed to limit the amount of sexual exploitation to which the female slaves were subjected to just one man for the entire life. And practice law, there were places in Cairo where you could go and officially purchase a slave woman as a concubine, spend the night with her, and then return her to the merchant the next day as defective. And the merchant would take her back for a fee, of course. And then that same merchant would sell the same poor woman again to a different client the next day, and on and on. Essentially, that slave trader would run a brothel by exploiting a loophole in the law. 
I remember reading similar horror stories of sexual enslavement about the ISIS extremists who occupied parts of Syria until recently. So that history is not that far removed from us, unfortunately. So what were Muslim slaves used for then? Uh, when we think of slavery, we usually think of agricultural labor, Roman Latifunia or Jamaican sugar plantation. Well, Muslim owners did some of that, especially early on in 9th century Iraq, uh, where slaves were put to work draining the swamp around Bathra in the south to turn them into fields for cultivation. Uh, but the number of slaves in southern Iraq grew so large and the treatment was so bad that the slaves there revolted. And that's known as the Zanj Revolt from 869 to 883. Uh, and that's one of the three largest slave revolts in history. Uh, we already covered the Spartacus slave revolt in ancient Rome. In the second half of the course, we'll have a whole lecture on the Haitian slave revolt in the 1790s. So the Zanj Revolt, that would be the last member of that glorious trilogy. Uh, the leader, Ali, was a Shiite Muslim, and that has an interesting mix, uh, religious dynamic uh, to that mix. Like many slave revolts, the Zanj revolt started out pretty well. Ali's army even came within striking distance of the capital of the Arab Empire, Baghdad. But eventually, as usually happens, the dominant classes rallied their forces and they put down the revolt and beheaded the leader, Ali. One long-term consequence of the Zanj revolt, however, is that later Muslim rulers were very uncomfortable about employing too many slaves in a large-scale plantation-style setting. Instead, they would prefer to employ slaves, especially females and children, in a domestic setting as servants and such. This way, the risk of revolt was lower. Of course, employing women in a domestic setting put them at risk of sexual exploitation. We saw earlier that some slaves were effectively employed as prostitutes in Brussels by twisting Quranic law. But even without twisting the law, it was perfectly acceptable under Sharia to buy a slave as a long-term sexual partner, what was called a concubine. Under Muslim law, a man was allowed to marry up to four free wives if he could, uh, if he could afford it, and a wife in that context meant a free woman with certain rights. However, there was no limit to the number of concubines one could have since concubines were slaves and did not count as part of the marriage quota. As a result, some Muslim rulers had enormous numbers of concubines, at least 300 for the Ottoman rulers of Turkey, or some Fatimid rulers in Cairo had a harem of over 12,000 women. I assume that a ruler could not physically have sex with all 12,000 women on a regular basis, and that this amounted to some form of uh, conspicuous consumption, showing off one's wealth, at the expense of all these poor female slaves, of course. Those concubines were kept in a special place of the palace known as a harem or seraglio, and that harem became an endless subject of fascination for male Europeans, who were respected, re restricted by their own monogamous rules of Christianity, and kind of envied the Muslims in that regard as males. So if you visit the 19th century European section of an art museum, you'll encounter many oriental style paintings made by Europeans, uh, especially interior scenes of harems depicting uh, an odalisque, which is another term for a female sex slave. Very common motif in 19th century art. And it's kind of off topic for today's lecture, but there are a million things that an art historian could say about those odalisque paintings, which are the 19th century version of uh, softcore porn. Uh, refer yourself uh, to the works of Edward Said regarding European vision of the Orient, as well as the works of feminist authors uh, complaining about the, the male gaze in European art, because those Odalisk paintings are definitely a good example of the male gaze. Take my word for it as a man. But back to medieval slavery in the Muslim world. Uh, sultans would need men to run the harems, preferably men who could not have sex with the concubines, so for that reason, many men, uh, Muslim slaves that were male, uh, were employed as eunuchs, i.e. castrated slaves. And we already encountered that term when we studied Ming China. Uh, the Chinese emperors also employed eunuchs in their bureaucracy. Well, Muslims also employed other men as soldiers slash slaves. Uh, these were known as the Mamluks in Egypt or in the Ottoman Empire as the Janissaries of Turkey. And it might seem odd to teach one's own slaves how to fight. After all, that would raise the risk of revolt tremendously. 
Uh, but Muslim rulers thought that such slaves, because they were trained from childhood to fight and to obey, they were perfect professional soldiers with some enduring loyalty to their owner and master. Until, that is, they took over in a palace coup, uh, which is what eventually happened with the Mamluks in Egypt. As we saw earlier, Muslims could not enslave fellow Muslims, so they had to look outside the empire for slaves. Technically, it should have been possible to simply exploit the children of existing slaves and grow the population organically through natural means. Uh, but in practice, the slave population in the Muslim world did not produce enough offspring, and so there was a constant pressure to acquire more slaves from outside to replenish the ranks of a dwindling population. That could be done by war in a traditional jihad, especially in the 700s and 800s uh, AD when the Arab Empire expanded rapidly. Uh, but the concept of jihad could also be turned to something closer to slave raiding. Uh, let's say you were a slave trader in Cairo in the year 1000 and you need more slaves. You could travel to the southern Sudan, south of the Nile, uh, where locals were not Muslim. And then you could go to a village, read some long document in classical Arabic requesting that the local population submit to Islam or else. They would not respond, of course, since they could not understand a word of what you just said, and that would give you an excuse to say, look, these infidels refuse to convert to Islam. Let's declare jihad and enslave those villagers. Again, slave raiding under the cover of religious war. The goal there was not to expand Islam, quite the country. It was best to have some infidels in the borderlands who could be raided and enslaved on a regular basis. The same could be said of the North African pirates who roamed the Mediterranean until the 19th century. Uh, they routinely attacked U.S. and European ships and enslaved their crews officially as part of a jihad, uh, but really in a form of piracy. I'll mention that uh, piracy in North Africa in the second half of the course when I study the early history of Algeria. By the way, uh, uh, that's a reminder that Muslims enslaved all non-Muslims, and that included uh, European sailors as well as Africans. Uh, so in practice, as uh, Europe grew more powerful in the modern era, the main focus of Muslim slave trading venture became sub-Saharan Africa rather than Europe uh, or Asia. Alternatively, slaves could be simply purchased outright from foreign merchants, as long as they were not Muslim. And that's where people like Mitz and Musa could come in. As a powerful emperor in a region of the world, West Africa, where slavery was legal, uh, Mensa and Musa could buy or capture non-Muslim slaves and then sell them off to his trading partners in North Africa. The Sahara Desert, that might look like an insurmountable obstacle on the map, but it wasn't. Uh, they were well-established trading routes of caravan that transported slaves and various goods to and from Timbuktu, Mali, and North Africa. A similar route connected Egypt and North Africa to the Sudan and Ethiopia uh, via the Nile River. A third route would start in Arabia, like the Sultanate of Oman in the Middle East, and travel south across the Indian Ocean coast of East Africa uh, to places like Somalia, Kenya, and Tanzania today, uh, where there was an active slave trade well into the 19th century. Black slaves bought or captured in the interior of Africa in countries like today's Congo. Uh, they could be walked to the coast and then sold to visiting Muslim merchants on the Indian Ocean coast of East Africa. One key trading point on the coast was the Sultanate of Kilwa, K-I-L-W-A, in today's Tanzania, which peaked in the 13th to the 15th centuries. In Batuta, always him, visited that city during these voyages, and he was very impressed. Another later transit point was the island of Zanzibar, off uh, the coast of Tanzania, uh, which became a major emporium in the 19th century, uh, by which point as many as 20,000 slaves would be arriving uh, to Zanzibar every year. And just as was the case with Kilwa earlier, the slaves would be taken from uh, further west in Africa and walked to the coast uh, to Zanzibar and then sold to Muslim merchants uh, from the Middle East. And some were also employed locally in the island of Zanzibar on cloves plantation. About 75% of the population of Zanzibar uh, consisted of enslaved Africans. My guess is that you've learned in another class about the Atlantic slave trade from Africa to the Americas, right? But my guess is also that you had never heard of the Muslim slave trade until today. It is much less known, in part because the sources are not as good, and in part because this trade has not been studied as intensively, especially by U.S. scholars. Uh, 
but that Muslim slave trade was a major trade in world history. Uh, the rough estimates for the total number of African slaves exported over the various Muslim trade routes adds up to 14 million, uh, which, if accurate, is a rough number, would exceed the Atlantic slave trade, which transported 11 to 12 million African captives. There were some major differences, though, between the two trades. The Atlantic slave trade focused on male captives because they were expected to perform strenuous physical labor uh, like sugar cultivation, whereas the victims of the Muslim slave trade, they were often women uh, who were employed as domestic laborers or sex slaves. Another major difference was the time frame. Uh, the Atlantic slave trade began in the 1500s and ended in the 1800s with a peak in the late 1700s. The Muslim slave trade began with the first Arab conquest of the 600s, much earlier, and only ended in the early 1900s. So it was far more spread out over time, which may be the reason why its impact was less notable, noticeable year by year. Also notice the end point of the Muslim slave trade, the 1900s, which takes us uncomfortably close to the present. A country like Saudi Arabia only abolished slavery in 1962. Mauritania, the last country to officially abolish slavery, did so in 1981. I was actually born by that point. I can actually say that I lived during a time when slavery was legal in parts of the world. In a way, you could almost say that you, even if you're younger, because for that matter, millions of people are still locked, unofficially now, in exploitative labor systems that amount to de facto slavery, whether it's in Libya, Niger, Pakistan, India, or wherever. I always get excited when I teach about a historical topic and I can tell students, look, it's still relevant today. Uh, but when it comes to slavery, it's rather dispiriting uh, to know that it's still ongoing unofficially today. Let's also mention a less horrific impact of the slave trade to the Americas and to the Muslim world. In both cases, the horrors of the slave trade led to cultural encounters and the creation of a new syncretic culture. In the Americas, for example, African captives interacted with the European masters and with Native Americans to create a mixed religion like voodoo or mixed languages like the Gula dialect in the US. I have a lecture in the modern part of the World History course if you're interested. Same thing in East Africa, uh, where Arab slave traders and African slaves from the interior also interacted to create a hybrid Swahili culture, it was called. And that culture included a language also called Swahili, uh, which is based on African Bantu words, uh, but incorporates many Arabic loan words. And that's still widely spoken in East Africa today. So there's some uh, cultural mixing that came out of the Muslim slave trade as well. Well, I will stop here for today. Uh, we got to study the empire of Mali under its founder, Sumyata Keda, and its richest king, Mansa Musa, as well as the trade routes that connected Mali to the Muslim world, including, sadly, the slave trading routes. Next time, we will head south to the kingdom of the Congo in central West Africa, and that will allow us to study a third form of slavery, the beginnings of the Atlantic slave trade to the Americas. Goodbye. Au revoir.